As my grandmother would say, I'm from South Carolina, and I'm happy to be here with you in North Carolina. I'm so happy that last night I came to Raleigh. I brought two friends with me who are educators in South Carolina, uh, who have been helping me with work with my book and the promotion, but are also teachers, so help keep that perspective really, really grounded. And uh, we went to dinner uh, right downtown last night, and I wore my Clemson orange shoes along with my Apple Watch that has an orange band and purple uh, face on it, and uh, my Clemson T-shirt because I am a Clemson Tiger. That's where I went to school. Uh, but NC State is a great school. I had some students that I taught that went there, and friends that attended NC State. So I'm super excited to be with you. Let's see if I can work this microphone. So Mary mentioned to you that I am, I work in South Carolina at the state level, but today I'm coming to you as your colleague, as your peer, as LaToya. I want to be sure to say that. I work for our state superintendent. I'm the director of school transformation, and I have been in your shoes. I've been principal of an elementary school, principal of a middle school. I have been a teacher at a middle school level. I did my student teaching at a high school. I coached two sports when I was a teacher. I'm not, I was national board certified. I've done it all, and I almost died. I almost died. That's why I wrote the book, Burned Out, Beaten Up, Fighting Back. And I almost died because I almost lost my way about why I became an educator to start with. So today I want to do what uh, we've talked about. I want to shift the conversation. And we're going to talk about some real raw things. If you don't know me, uh, you'll find out, and my friends are here, that I like to keep it real. I like to tell it just how it is. So when I was thinking about how I would um, talk with you about some of the future focused things, I went and looked at shifting the conversation and rebrand and see to see you know what is the platform all about i revisited it and there's one thing that stood out to me it says innovative ideas that support the rebranding of public education but the thing that stood out for me is said shatter the status quo for school leaders shatter the status quo and i have always been a rebel i have never ever followed the rules and even as a school principal, I didn't follow the rules. Mary can speak to that. I was the one principal in the meeting when the superintendent stood up and said X, Y, Z, and everybody's looking around and texting and nobody agrees. Latoya will say it. People would call me. Are you going to say something about that? But everybody has a voice. And today I dare you to use yours in a way that I think will be meaningful for the students we serve. So let's take a walk down memory lane. This country has been talking about reforming education for a long time. Right? We all know the landmark case, 1954, Brown versus Board of Education. Some of you are probably familiar with the South Carolina case that preceded Brown versus Board, Briggs versus Elliott in Clarendon County, South Carolina, that led to that ruling that said separate was not equal. That having separate schools was inherently unconstitutional and inequitable to our students. So in 1966, there was the release of the Coleman Report. The Civil Rights Act was in 1964, and the Coleman Report said, we know from science and research that our kids need to be educated together, not separately. In 1967, that's when President Johnson passed the Elementary, Secondary, and Education Act, and he declared a war on poverty. So now we got two, two, two problems framed for us. One, we need to integrate our schools, and two, we need to eradicate poverty. In 1983, here comes Ronald Reagan with a nation at risk. There's a problem in education. Other nations are outperforming us. It is a rising tide of mediocrity. He began to call our work mediocre. And that, my friends, is when the war on public education began. Because it was no longer about poverty and integration. It was about our work, that our work was mediocre that we were being outperformed by other nations. And then in 2002, my favorite, AYP. <coughs> so how many of y'all were principals during the AYP era? Mm -hmm. Adequate year of progress. That's a joke if I have ever heard of one. <laughs> and I say all that to you to say I was a good principal. I got good results. These people in the room that came with me can stand for it. I took an elementary school in the first district that I was in that was the 14th lowest performing school in the district to the first. We had five years of continuous academic improvement. I'm a rebel, but I am tenacious. I like to win. I cannot stand to lose. I will kill myself. We're going to die, but we're going to win. 
And then I went to North Carolina and was co-principal with my dear friend Michael Wakesness at Knox Middle School that has been an F school forever. And in two years, we were off the low performing list. But that was not the problem. That school went right back on the low performing list when we left. <clears throat> that was not the problem. So in 2002, No Child Left Behind said, you know, here's the problem. These schools have low expectations for these kids, and they need to be punished. So we're going to come up with some consequences if you don't make adequate yearly progress. And you're going to have to produce every year, get better and better. I mean, it was unreasonable. It was an unreasonable, non-scientific, statistically invalid, flawed system. But how many of us as leaders subscribe to it? How many of us stood in front of our staff and said, you are going to do better. We are going to make AYP. You're not giving me enough. you got to try harder. Your EVOS is bad. Do you know the root of EVOS? Do you know this? Now, remember I told you I'm not in my official capacity. Do you know EVOS was designed to predict the growth of corn? Did you know that? It was never designed to be a tool to measure the effectiveness of educators. It has been proven over and over again by some of the best psychometricians in the world that it is invalid, flawed. It is not a reliable way to measure educator effectiveness. Read the research. A teacher in Houston sued, went to the federal Supreme, went to the Supreme Court, and she won. But we have drank Kool-Aid. We have believed exactly what they've told us about how we should be accountable, but we're doing the work. Do we make the rules for the American Medical Association? Are we the ones deciding if doctors are effective? Do we say if X number of people die from X number of diseases, then your practice needs to be shut down? Are we slapping an F on lawyers' offices? Are we putting a D out there for people who uh, are engineers because they, civil engineers, they build a bridge, the bridge collapses, they go out of business, we put an F and make it public for everybody to know they're a failure? Where is your voice? How are you using it? What is your philosophy of education? Whose philosophy are you subscribing to? Because I know in the schools that I've worked in, we worked hard. And that one day when report cards came out, in no way captured the work that teachers and students and parents and community members did in my school. I refuse to let that be the definition of success. Do we need to be held accountable? Absolutely. But we need a voice at the table. Other people cannot define that for us. They don't know the work. They can't do the work. You want to hear a funny story before I move on? So my sister is an engineer. I have two older sisters. We all went to Clemson. I know nobody cares. I'm in North Carolina. Nobody cares. <laughs> nobody cares. But I care. So I'm see. So my sister Lisa is an engineer. And she worked, uh, she's worked for lots of different companies. Right now she works for Continental Tire. And you talk about future focus, she told me she's the only person on her team who only speaks English. She's 44. She's the mother of four children. They're all girls. Her husband's an engineer. She's the only person who only speaks English on her team. She's an engineer. She's been an engineer for 20 years. What kind of language opportunities are you giving your students? So she's worked for IBM, DuPont. Lowe's Corporate was her job before she, in Morrisville, North Carolina, before she went to Continental. And she had to go, they partner with schools. And uh, she worked in the patio, my friends are laughing because they've heard this story. She worked in the patio uh, yard division and she does forecasting for materials, I, I don't know, math, science, engineering stuff. And they, she had to teach a lesson with second grade. She was so excited because she always wanted to be a teacher. But she had a teacher tell her not to be a teacher, that she was too smart to be a teacher, and that she needed to be an engineer, and told her how much engineers made. And we grew up real poor, so when she found out engineers made that kind of money, of course, she was like, I'm going to be an engineer. So anyway, she went to this school. She's teaching this lesson. And this second grader, <laughs> she, she does half the lesson. They go to lunch. They come back. She said, what did you guys think of it, of what we did this morning? And she said, this second grader said, boring. <laughs> And she said to me, what happens to second graders after lunch? Those boys started bouncing around. People were throwing stuff across the room. Some of the girls were sitting there. What in the world? She was like, they are like constantly going. I was like, yes. And she has four kids between the ages of four. She has a four-year-old and a sixth grader. 
so they'll give you the age span. They're all girls. I mean, people outside of our profession don't know what we do, and we don't bother to tell them. We let them have their opinions, and we don't say anything. We got to speak up. So let's keep going. That was then, this is now. Then in 2009, President Barack Obama did the Race to the Top Initiative. $4.3 billion, I believe. He said, I'm going to incentivize it. I'm going to give you some money if you can race to the top. Where did anybody go? Where are we racing? We've had all kinds of names. No child left behind. Race to the top. I mean, you name it. We've had all kind of rhetoric around you got to do better and produce more. So here we are, 2012, and we have had no child left behind. And I can remember that era because I'd have parents write me notes that said, and this ain't no child left behind. <laughs> you ain't doing nothing. And PISA results come out and they say, you know, we're still not doing as well as our international counterparts. Here's what we did not do. We didn't look at how our international counterparts were treating the profession. We didn't look at the conditions of teaching and learning of our international counterparts. We simply looked at the results. The ends, not the means. You know, in Finland, teaching is one of the most popular professions. They have a very, very deep, broad way they put teachers into practice. They don't do it the way we do it. They don't demoralize. It's not a low-paying field. It has a lot of respect. The, the, the whole landscape of the profession looks different. And then we started with uh, uh, ESSA. Every Student Succeeds Act. And I've had a lot of work, I've done a lot of work in our state. I helped write our state consolidated ESSA plan for how we would comply with federal law around <laughs> school improvement. And ESSA gave some flexibility to be innovative, but people are so married to the way we've always done things. If you look at different states' ESSA plans, you'll find very little that's any more innovative than what we've done before. So here we are in 2018. And what are our problems? What are the issues? Well, right now we're talking about personalization. Everything's Burger King. Have it your way. How do we personalize ed education for every child? Give them exactly what they need. I'm all for that. I think that's a great thing. Poverty. We're talking about poverty. How does poverty affect the brain? What does poverty do to kids? Trauma-informed, uh, ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. Uh, mental health is a big thing. We're talking about segregation again. Remember the Coleman Report in 1967? It is 2018, and we are talking about segregation again. And I'm going to get on y'all now. I'm getting ready to embarrass some of y'all. And if y'all don't like me, want to beat me up, meet me outside. I still got it. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about the demoralization of the profession. But I'm going to tell you something. I walked in this room, and I told my friends who came with me, I said, look at these people. Look around. Who are you sitting with? The people who look just like you. We cannot begin as educators to talk about integration if we don't model that. If we don't reach across the aisle and across the table. We have a responsibility because we know since 1967 that integration is best for all kids. Research after research after research. We know that. But when I worked in North Carolina, I can remember our first football game. I said to our resource officer, they don't have no black kids at China Grove. The whole team was white and our whole team was black. I had never seen anything like that. Where I live in South Carolina, things were a lot more balanced. If you read about the Rock Hill School District, you'll read about how they worked against segregation, the retired resegregation. Our schools are very balanced. We have some very progressive superintendents who pushed the community and said, we got to all have together. How many of you work in districts where it's pretty, it's pretty separate? There are some majority minority schools or majority poverty, concentrated poverty schools. What are you saying about that? What are you saying about that? We know, we know that does not produce good kids. And I want you to make, I want to be clear with you. I want you to make no mistake. I'm not saying poor kids or kids of minority can't learn. I was a poor kid. I grew up in the projects. My mother was a single parent. I was as poor as they come. I was going to be a rapper, by the way. I was planning on dropping out of Clemson when I was a sophomore. I was in a rap group. I came home for Christmas break and informed my mother that I'd be moving to Atlanta with my rap group, Microphone Militants, and she informed me that I would be going back to school. <laughs> <laughs> and so therefore, that didn't work out, but I still rap on the side. 
Sometimes I text Dr. Kim here my songs that I produce. <laughs> but what I am saying is we are not, we have not begun in this country, in our states, to tackle equity. We're nowhere near close to it. We haven't begun to tackle equity. And I don't hear school leaders talking about it. I hear them talking about the hardship of leading a low-performing, high-poverty school. But I don't hear them talking about the inequity that inherently exists when you concentrate all the poverty kids who are in poverty in the same school building. They don't say anything about that. And if they do talk about it, who are you talking to? Other educators. Are you talking to your congressmen? Are you talking to your legislators? Are you talking to legislators? Are you talking to your governor? We like to keep our talk internal. And it doesn't help. We keep it in the teacher's lounge. I told somebody, being an educator is like being in a fraternity. Suddenly all your friends are educators. When you become a principal, all your friends are principals. When you go work for the State Department, you don't have no friends. But <laughs> school segregation is still a problem. March 18th, Newsweek. School segregation in America is as bad as it was in the 1960s. March 2018, school segregation, this was from the Atlantic, is not a myth. Skeptics claim that, that concerns over racially divided schools are false alarms, but they're missing the full picture. Trust Ed, as America grows more diverse, schools are becoming more segregated. Is that crazy or what? I was reading some information from Learning Policy Institute, which is a policy institute that Linda Darling Hammond, one of the most renowned scholars in education, uh, is a part of. And it said that since 1988, the percentage of schools in the United States who are extremely segregated has risen from 5% to 18.8 .8 or so percent. What are school leaders saying about this? Who are you waiting on? You waiting on your governor? to say we're going to balance schools, you're waiting on the parents in your community to say I'm okay and my child goes to school with somebody who's not just like them. We have to lead this conversation. I believe this with my whole heart. Nicole Hannah-Jones did a great story on integration. I don't know how many of you follow her or know her. She works for the New York Times. I actually got to hear her speak. We were on a panel with her for a, a particular uh, rural poverty uh, uh, event that we had. And here, in U.S. News, the question, have U.S. schools become more racially segregated in the past two decades? It should seem a simple question to answer based on racial, racial compositions of schools then and now, but it's a raging debate. It turns out there are different ways to measure segregation or racial diversity, and the different measures can sometimes point in opposite directions. I promise you, if you take some time after we leave here and you study this, and some of you may know it in your own district. You will see that this is a problem. So here it is, we have a system that says you must achieve X. I know North Carolina grades just came out the other day. And I can remember the first year I was a principal in North Carolina and we got an F. It is so demoralizing. I was like, I ain't no F. I don't care what they say, I'm not an F. It is so demoralizing. It is not incentivizing. It does not make you want to work harder. It does not make you want to wake up in the morning and do better. It makes you believe that nobody believes in you. So we've got a system that perpetuates inequity, concentrated poverty, and segregation, and then we're going to put F's on schools, which is the opposite of research. I guarantee you, if you did a cross-analysis of poverty and school grades in North Carolina, because I've done it, you're gonna, it's A to F, you can line up A to F, just line up poverty. Whoever has the most poverty is gonna have an F, who has the least is gonna have an A. Be careful what thought you're subscribing to, because I walked around for 19 years, 18 years, 17, 17 years thinking, I was, oh, when people would ask me, tell me about your school, tell me about your principalship. I began to describe things like, we had great academic performance, we did well on tests, we, uh, for five years in a row, I forgot about the things I write about in my book. When I had a student who ran away over the weekend and her grandmother called me on a Saturday, I'm sitting in a drive-thru of Chick-fil-A with my sister saying she cannot find her. That's what I'm proud of, that I had that kind of relationship 
where the grandmother thought enough to call me so I could help her. When I had students who came to school and said, we don't have blankets, it's supposed to be cold this weekend, can you help us, Dr. Dixon? Of course I can, absolutely. That's what I'm proud of. When I had a student who came to NC State for our college tour, we wrote grants so every one of our middle school students could visit colleges. And our sixth graders would go smaller places like two-year old community colleges. And our seventh graders would go larger places. And our eighth graders, we would take them to big places like NC State. And I had a student who came to the NC State field trip for the college tour, and he came back the next day and he said to me, have you ever had anybody tell you you can't do something? I said, absolutely. He said, what'd you do? I said, prove, prove, you know me. I said, why? Why are you asking me that? Who said to you? He said, well, I went home and I told my mom I was going to go to NC State. And she told me, you might as well forget about it. I said, what are you going to do? He said, prove a wrong. That's what I'm proud of. I gave him an opportunity to see life in a different way. I am not defined as an educator by my accomplishments. Am I proud of the fact that I have an education, a PhD from the University of South Carolina, a master's degree, a specialist degree, all from the University of South Carolina, <laughs> a degree in English from Clemson University? Absolutely, I'm proud of that. Am I proud of the work I did as a principal and what we accomplished? Yes. But I do not define that pride simply by the academic achievement results that are measured by a single high stakes assessment on a single day for 19 years worth of work, absolutely not. But I see people who are drinking that cocktail and it's killing them. I see educators who are demoralized. I see teachers, I had a teacher sit across from me one time, I will never forget it. And she said, I just feel like a bad teacher. And I said, why do you feel like a bad teacher? She said, well, my EVOS is just green, it's not blue. How many of you have had teachers say that to you? What are you communicating to the people you work with? What matters for our kids? Who decided that that matters? Did we decide that? Did we come up with that accountability system? Who decided that? Who's at the policy table for practitioners? You see, there is a gap between policy and practice. And I've been able to see it firsthand because I get to talk to those people who make policy decisions. I remember being in a room uh, with some policy organizations uh, and looking around the room and thinking to myself, how many of these people have ever been a teacher? <clears throat> and some of the things they were talking about, well, if you know me, you know I had to speak up for us. But we sit back. We don't get involved. We vote for people who don't like our profession, who attack public education. I don't know about you, but uh, I know the difference between proficiency and growth. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd be willing to bet you, if you check the records, educators, selected folks who do not have public education interest at, in its best interest. We got to do better. We can't roll over. We got to speak up. That's why you got teachers all across the country demanding better compensation. And so here we are, here we are, and this is now, 2018, and we're still talking about poverty and integration. We're still talking about what poverty does to the brain. We were talking about it in 1966, and we're still talking about it. We have not attacked these two problems adequately. So what are the consequences when we start saying we're going to punish our way to success? Let me tell you something. There's no cocktail of punishment that you can place on a school that will produce better results. There's no such thing. School improvement doesn't happen because you scare people or fear people into having a worse label. It's about people improvement. Our work is rooted in community, in relationships, in equity. That's what our work is about. So in 2013, there was a commission called for each and every child. They wrote a report called a Strategy for Education, Equity, and Excellence. And they particularly looked at pay for performance, evaluating teachers uh, based on test scores. And here's what they concluded, that policies that use such measures tend to misclassify the competence of teachers, as well as reduce the morale of teachers, create disincentives to teach the highest need students, undermine confidence, public confidence in schooling, and encourage teacher preparation programs at schools to focus on raising test scores rather than teaching important concepts. Do you see this in your district? How many of you have vacancies right now? 
How many of you had a hard time finding teachers? Oh, yeah. See, when I started as an administrator, I would have a position, and I promise you, I'd have 80 applicants for one third grade teaching position. I do five or six rounds of interviews because I could pick who I wanted, honey, get the best. Now I'm like, please come in here with some common sense. <laughs> I hope you don't have a criminal record. <laughs> you can pass the background check, see y'all left because it's the truth. And if you can do that, I'll work with you. Yeah. I can help you become a better teacher. You got a good heart, you're a good person, we can do it. <laughs> but why is it that we can't find teachers? Whose fault is it? What's contributed to the teacher shortage? If you were a student, what example have we set for our students with this public narrative that public schools are failing? Else on schools. If you are a student sitting in school, would you want to be a teacher? But I am committed. I had to make this decision. I am committed. I'm going to finish my career in public education. I'm going to do it. I'm committed because teaching matters. I remember when I told my mother at 18, I'm the youngest of three, that I want to be a teacher. My other sister is in business. She works for Apple. No, I can't get you nothing free. <laughs> I can't get nothing free either. But my mother said to me, we need good teachers. I'm glad you want to be a teacher. We need good teachers. And she's always said to me, in some of my deepest, darkest moments when I have said, I don't know if I can do this anymore, it is wearing me out. I can't sleep. I'm anxious. My stomach hurts in the morning. I don't want to go. It's crazy. Somebody's mama cussed me out yesterday. She do that again. I'm going to show a toy. <laughs> you know, I'm just kidding. But, sort of. But, <laughs> you get tired of that. You get bullied by parents. You get talked about by politicians. You watch the news, and the only stories about teachers are the ones who are sleeping with students. You turn on the TV, and it's schools, uh, North Carolina schools, grades came out, uh, very little show improvement. Why did uh, Superintendent Johnson give everybody an iPad? That's not going to help. I mean, I'm just saying. That's what the narrative is. When have you got hopped on social media and seen anything that made you feel like, yes, I'm in the, one of the most noble professions in the world? Because you are. You are in one of the most noble professions in the world. And I'm going to tell you how I know that. I know that because I know without a shadow of a doubt, as a child of poverty growing up in a single parent home, that if I had not gone through a quality school system, I would not stand before you today as Dr. Latoya Dixon. I would not. But it was because I had some good educators in my life. I had some great teachers and some good principals who pushed and said, you're going to make it. And you're going to do it. And if you don't, I'm going to call your mom. We have to do a better job of advocating for ourselves. Quit subscribing to policies that we didn't create. People now deciding whether or not we should be the ones carrying around guns. Now, I don't know what your personal opinion is, but when I went to school to be a teacher, I didn't go to school to carry around a gun. We didn't create that problem. We don't deserve to bear the responsibility for solving it. And so what's the consequence? We got a teacher shortage. People can't find teachers. And so what happens when you can't find a teacher? You do what I just said. You get who you can, that person, you work with them. And then what happens when your school report card comes out? You're back in the same boat, right? Your superintendent wants to know what you're going to do about these test scores. Because you ain't made no improvement. Your eighth grader still can't pass the, uh, the math one in the course. What are you saying back? How are you pushing back? I'm not telling anybody to go lose their job and be disrespectful. But there is an intelligent way to have a scholarly conversation around these things that we are talking about. There are tons of research. There's tons of research out there that tells us that the root of the problems we're facing don't have anything to do with some of the solutions that have been brought forth. We have yet to tackle inequity. We refuse to do it. So here are my points of advocacy. This is what I'm all about. Number one, compensation. I hate when people say, we all know we didn't do it for the money. 
That may be true, but what you're doing when you say that is you're giving per people permission to continue perpetuating the low pay of educators. We deserve to be paid. When I was a first year teacher and my sister who now works for Apple, I used to call her and say I got $20 and it's 17 days left and cry and she would drive from Charlotte and bring me $500 here or there. I ate so many peanut butter sandwiches, I thought I'd choke on peanut I can't even eat oodles and noodles anymore. I can't eat them. When I get them up to my nose, I start gagging. I remember thinking, I went to college for this. I'm just as poor as I was growing up. Only thing changed, I got air conditioning. Seriously. Quit downplaying conversation. We deserve to be paid. We are professionals. We're certified. We're credentialed. What other profession do you got to take a test and get certified and prove your qualifications before? Engineers don't have to do that. You need continuing education. Yeah. Engineers don't have to do that. They can. They can get their professional engineering license if they want. They don't have to do that. Please. Compensation matters. And it matters and it's important. And people need deserve a quality of life where you don't have to work a second and third job. I remember I write about this in a book. One of the best teachers we had after school one day, she said to me, oh, it's almost payday. We just finished bus duty. I said, I know, girl. She said, I can't wait because I'm going to buy my contacts and I won't have to teach with one contact. She had been teaching with one contact because she couldn't afford to buy the other one and had a second job. 75% of our staff had second and third jobs. I was having a post-conference, y'all know North Carolina system, a post-conference. We were having a similar one in South Carolina with a teacher, and she said, I'm so sorry. After I finished my uh, job at Goodwill, I went home, I helped my daughter with her homework, and I was trying to finish this up for our conversation. I fell asleep on the couch. You should not have to work a second job or accept a vow of poverty because you choose to be an educator. It's wrong, flat out, period, point blank. We deserve to be compensated accordingly. My second one is wellness. We've got to talk about educated wellness. We've got to talk about mental, physical, spiritual health for educators. It's important. It's stressful. It's an emotionally taxing job when you're carrying the burdens of children, of other adults. We've got to come up with some ways to, to have some wellness policies in our schools, and our districts, to help people do this work in a healthy, balanced way. You ever worried about where someone's sleeping at night? I know you have. You're educators or what they're eating, or what they're going to eat since it's Christmas break. I had a kid, I remember, I will never forget this. He was, I thought he was so nice. Every day at the end of lunch, he would get people's trays and he would take it to the trash can. And then I looked over one day, my co-principal said, look, at, look over there. And he was eating out of the trash can. He was eating the leftovers on their plate. And I worried about that. And it's human to worry about that. People say, oh, you have to learn to compartmentalize. No, we gotta work on wellness. We gotta have some social supports in schools for kids. We gotta do something about helping mental health of students and teachers. The third point of advocacy for me is policy. We gotta have a seat at the policy table, as Mary said. Otherwise, we're on the menu. So you gotta talk to your legislators. You gotta pick up the phone. You gotta give that story that you're talking about, not just to the people that are in your building or who are already educators, but to the ones who are making those decisions that impact you so that they know what that looks like in practice. And we've got to help bridge the gap between policy and practice. So we're talking about shattering the status quo. These are my beliefs. I think educators who advocate boldly define what success looks like in public education for themselves. They're not afraid to share that. They examine their personal philosophies to be sure they're not unconsciously agreeing with something that's been given to them. They pledge to be courageous. They read and research. They take a keen interest in educational policy. They don't wait until something happens to say, oh, um, that's the policy? When the policy is being developed, they're weighing in. They're a stakeholder. We've got to make educated wellness a priority. I'm telling y'all, I, I got to a place where I just I, I didn't know anymore. I tried running, I played tennis, and I could get on that treadmill some days after school and I felt like I could run for the rest of my life, trying to run away from it. But I always had to go back to it. We've got to work on that in schools. They advocate externally and internally. They tell their stories. They tell their stories, not just to each other, to the people who matter. They tell them in the grocery store, at church, at work, on Twitter, on social media, they're bold and courageous. I dare you 
I dare you to tell the whole story. I dare you to take your performance grade and write your own story for your for school year last year. They encourage others to enter the profession and they support others in staying in it. Some of the things I've heard that have hurt me the most is people say, oh, don't be a teacher, who are teachers or principals. We have to support each other because our kids are, are depending on us. They use their voices to inform teacher preparation programs. We all went somewhere to be a teacher. You need to be talking to people about what you weren't ready for, how they can improve their program. Go back and talk to your Methodist professor, whoever it was you had, and say, let me tell you what it's really like on the inside. And they engage locally, nationally, and globally around the profession. You got to do all three of those. So here are some questions for you. Here's my challenge for you. I think it's important when we start talking about education reform and future-focused leadership going forward. How do you protect your why? How do you protect your why? The reason you became an educator to start with, because what happened to me is my why got disrupted and discombobulated, and I did not protect it. And so I had to like figure out what I was going to do. Luckily, I've been able to get myself back together. I'm fighting back now. How are you going to protect your why? How can you take the lead in the narrative around public education policy? What are you doing, not just to use your voice, but to make sure your voice is heard? Because I'm all over Twitter. All over it. And I'm speaking different places. I'm sharing things. Anybody call me and ask me. I speak everywhere. People ask me and they say, what will you charge? Nothing. Because I care about this work. It's important to our kids. What can we do to improve the health of the profession? Our profession is sick. We got a teacher shortage, it's sick. It's not healthy. I was listening to a podcast the other day. It said, it's like we have mono. We're walking around with a fever. We're not well. We look like we're well, but we're not. People aren't choosing the, the major in college. Not only do we have a teacher shortage, we have kids who are not choosing to become teachers. It's not going to get better. It's only going to get worse. We got to start right now attacking that. How can you advocate for America's continuous, persistent refusal to address inequity? Call it what it is when you see it. Call it what it is. I do. Some people don't like it. That's okay. But I go to bed at night and I feel good that I told them. The problem is you have stripped this community of every single resource it's had, concentrated poverty in this one school, because you didn't want mixed schools. You want a separate school, and now you want me to tell you how you can make this school better. That's the problem. What can you do to bring attention to that inequity? It's all across our nation, y'all. What are the possible consequences if we don't speak up as educators? What's the consequence? 10 years from now, y'all sitting in this room, it's 2018, in 2028, What's going to happen if you get up from this today? And you must care because it's Saturday. You could be home watching college football. Like, I'm going to watch Clemson tonight. It's going to be awesome. I make my friends watch it. They don't even like football. But if they be with me, they got to watch it. They get to eat wings. <laughs> what in the world are the consequences if we don't say anything? Are we going to have a privatized system? Are we going to have a system of the haves and the have-nots? Where those who have have a choice and those who do not, do not. If you pay real close attention, we've already tried to let people choose. What happens when people choose? They do the same thing some of y'all did when you walked in here. They choose to be all together just alike. We're flawed humans. We have to legislate some things to help ourselves. Because even though we know it's better, we don't always do better, right? Just like you know, if you want to lose weight, you can't eat everything you want. <laughs> right? Yeah. But what do you do? Go ahead and go through that drive-thru and say, make that a large. <laughs> right? And can I get some sriracha on hot sauce? <laughs> That's what we do, right? We know better, but we just don't do it. That's why we've got to have some policies in place that give us the structure we need 
to bring our kids the absolute best quality education. And we've got to quit turning it into educators are a failure, public schools are, are a failure. It's a part of being in a democracy. It's about producing an educated citizenry that can continue to build America and make America what it's supposed to be. What it's supposed to be. So my question is, what are you going to do now? I've talked to you. I'm well over my time. I'm sorry. But what are you going to do now? What are you going to do when you leave here? Other than get in the car and say, she was preaching, honey. I bet she could have been a preacher. No, I couldn't. I'm the number one sinner. What are you going to do when you go back to your principal's meeting? When you have an opportunity to engage as a stakeholder and to speak up when you hear somebody saying things like, the teachers just have low expectations. Now, I'm going to tell y'all, I have not met a principal yet who said, I have low expectations for my students. I want them to do poorly. I am so, I, I have not met, I, that, I don't believe that. I just don't believe that. I think sometimes people don't know how to get to where they want to go. But I don't believe that people wake up in the morning and have low expectations. But what are you going to do? How long are we going to let other people lead our work? When are we going to become the Bar Association? It's made up of who? Lawyers. When are we going to become the American Medical Association? It's made up of doctors. Yet the policy that's being set for us is made by non-educators. I reject that. Every single bit of it. All of it. Join me. I'm fighting back. You can find my book on Amazon. I was supposed to bring them here, but I don't pay attention because I'm always busy. So I had to text Mary last night and say, Mary, I'm sorry, I got one book. And she was like, you slack, but that's okay. <laughs> she didn't say that. But the book's on Amazon. And uh, if you are more interested in any of the work I do, I have a website. It's called leadershipwithlatoya.org. Please follow me on Twitter. Uh, some people in here already do. I see a friend back there. Uh, and uh, join me. we got work to do. Thank you. Thank you.